Hello. Um, I'm gonna apologize right now and kind of just give a forewarning that this video is gonna be a heavier one. And if that's not really in your capacity or you're just not in the mood for it, like you completely don't have to watch it. You don't have to watch any of these. Like nobody has to watch any of these. Um, however, I personally feel the need to give myself that space to talk about it publicly because I feel like a lot of people around me aren't letting me have that space out of their own discomfort. And so I will give you that choice right now. Um, I will be discussing just, I guess, dying in general, death in general, more specifically dying in, you know, relation to myself. Um, so if you don't want to, now's your time, you can head out, that is totally cool. Um, with that said, clearly getting the news that I got came with a lot. Um, and a lot of that has to do with my lifespan. Um, and to just give a background gauge of like people with CF and how long people are living these days. Um, when I was first diagnosed, I was abnormally diagnosed at 15, which is really, really late for a genetic disorder. Um, the, I don't remember the life expectancy because I Googled everything right away. The worst thing you can do, right? Like Google it. Um, I Googled my diagnosis and it was like, you're living to 35. Um, which, you know, scared the shit out of me. I was 15 and I was like, well, I only have 20 years to go. Um, and now I'm 23 and possibly only have around, you know, like, I don't know. I, it, it depends my, between my psych doctor and my transplant doctor. If I don't get a transplant, you know, one said one year, one said two years, you know, maybe two to five, depending, it's just like, you don't know, um, but uh, he, given my current status, I think a lot of my doctors, my other people I've talked to who, you know, work here in the hospital, which has been, yes, it kind of sucks, but it also has been a little nice to be able to talk to some people who have been around sick people all the time, some of the respiratory therapists that I trust, um, and, you know, looking at my numbers and my health statistically and looking at the rate um, of decline, the speed at which I've declined in the past, I would say about three years is like when it kind of really sped up. Um, you know, there are those higher, higher numbers, you know, five years, no very unlikely um if I don't you know if transplant is obviously not an option by then um because I think what a lot of people are forgetting here too is that it's not just if I make it a year um if I make it a year I still have to get reevaluated for transplant and I could easily like this could very easily happen where I make it a year and I get reevaluated for transplant but I also get denied for transplant because you have to be in a window and that window is very small and you can't be too healthy and yet you can't be too sick either and i think obviously before it was like this issue of i'm not sick enough for a transplant and then i physically got to the point aka right now where you know i'm like physically in that window of you're perfect for transplant but psychologically they're saying no um but I don't much, I don't have a lot of room, I guess, between where I am now and then moving into the last and final stage where you are deemed too ill for transplant because a lot of factors go into that, but you look at anesthesia, you look at um, just your general bodily strength, um, how your other organs are functioning, and if your body is not strong enough to withstand that much of a surgery, they will not perform it. And that is a huge, huge fear of mine because I think 
yes, there could be a good chance of me lasting the year, you know, if I keep up with all my medications, if I keep coming in for cleanouts every other month and all of that. However, I don't think I will qualify for a transplant and I still think at that point, then we like, it would be kind of stupid not to move just into palliative care because there's no coming back from that. Kind of what I, what I had mentioned before about reaching that state where you can't rebound anymore. And, you know, this whole thing is like, been incredibly hard to swallow. Um, the only reason I think I'm really able to talk about it right now without completely sobbing is I tend to be pretty numbed out during the day. Um, and then it's more at night when I'm, you know, completely alone and where everything kind of sinks in. Um, but it's just something I wanted to talk about and just talk about my feelings toward it because, you know, there was also before all this the choice to have a transplant or not have a transplant. And I think a lot of people view, you know, people in my position who choose not to have a transplant as, you know, kind of stupid or they're like suicidal or selfish or, you know, in the same way that like cancer patients who refuse to get further treatment and are just tired of going through absolutely relentless, painful, you know, chemotherapy, radiation, any form of cancer treatment, deny, you know, if they go get into a relapse and they don't want to do it anymore, the way people react to that tends to be really negatively. And I think it's like kind of the same, not completely the same, but it is uh, adjacent to the reaction that I would get having to choose to not get a transplant. And I know, I know that because I've had doctors straight up say they would be disappointed in me, which is also an issue we'll like address it at another time because no one should be putting pressure on their patient like that. It is their body. And frankly, they don't know how distressful it is to live in this body. Um, but yeah, this whole thing has just, I mean, without having to say it, done a 180 on me. Um, but I think what's been the most jarring part is this idea I had in my head, which is so naive, um, but I don't think it's uncommon for at least terminally ill or chronically ill patients to believe that when death comes along, it's not going to be a scary thing and it's not going um, to frighten them or really phase them at all because, you know, you're sitting here like, I do this many hours of treatments a day, I take all these meds a day, and it's not just doing that, but it's like, you take those medications, you do those treatments, and that right there is your daily reminder that you are, you know, that your body isn't working and that it's on its way downhill, you know? So I think we all kind of get this idea that like, we've cheated death, we've cheated the fear of death. Like, nice try, like you can't, you know, can't phase me because I deal with this every day. Um, and while there are some parts of that that can be truthful in the fact that I think all of us are way more comfortable talking about mortality than the average person, there is something to be said, however, about when things become like real, when things get said out loud to you, about you, about your situation, and it is no longer, you know, these people you don't know who had your disease, who went through this process and died, or it's no longer people you saw on Instagram pass away. Um, it's no longer that YouTuber you watched who, you know, had a disease and were, you know, very upbeat and did their best throughout all of it and yet still ended up dying. Um, I think I in my head, you know, and especially after like 
this summer. Um, so we have that factor, but we also have this factor that I, you know, I attempted suicide in June. I wanted to die. Um, I was very close to dying. Um, and so within a matter of literally months to go from one extreme of trying, literally trying very hard to die, um, to then being on your knees begging for a chance to live is like this mental backflip that you don't even like, you're like, how the hell did I, what? You know, like, I don't, there's no way around that. Um, <laughs> you're like, yesterday I was in a gurney because I tried to off myself and now I'm in the hospital begging for them to keep me here. You know, like it's, it's really mind boggling. Um, and I really am having trouble with that. Like, I really, it's like, I don't know what I want anymore. I don't know if I even want a transplant anymore. Like that, I'll just be frank with that. Um, but there are some factors in there where I feel a lot of guilt. Um, I think a lot of people feel that guilt and it's, you know, this guilt of wanting to do everything you can to keep yourself alive, even if that means you're miserable and in a lot of pain, simply for the sake of, you know, coming out of a place of love for those around you who care about you. You know, it's the idea sometimes of not getting a transplant getting put into palliative care hospice, getting as comfortable as I can and spending my last days with people I love, doing things I love and taking kind of the pressure and the stress away and just slipping more into a more accepting mindset versus this like fighting, you know, like, no, I gotta beat this thing deal can sound really soothing at times. Like, frankly, honestly, um, it can. And, but then at the same time, I feel so incredibly horrible and guilty. And I think there's so much shame around people who are ill who don't want to go through with every possible treatment there is. And it's so, like, it's so wrong because who are you to tell somebody that they need to do chemo or they need to get a transplant or they need to get some other extremely dangerous surgery or take a med that makes them feel like absolute shit every day um, when you're not in their shoes and you're not living their life. Um, you know, I said this before, I'll say it again. There's a difference between living and being alive. And that's something I very much consider in these, like in this situation, you know, um, right now is different. I'm not <laughs> completely like non-functional and there's a lot I can still do like once I get out of here and that's, I'm grateful for that. But I also know the road I'm going down is leading me right to a place that will not be like that. A place where I'm probably bedridden and I can't do anything. Um, I will fully be reliant on, you know, several different machines, likely, you know, whether it's oxygen or, I mean, CF can attack any, so many parts of your body. And it kind of is just, just this mystery, at least for me, my case has always been very odd um, to my doctors, you know, and, or it's not like the classic, I mean, all of our cases are different, but there's definitely cases that are all like a little more the same than mine. And I think like those grouped together versus what I'm dealing with, it's hard to predict, um, I guess, where, where I'll be in that time period. Um, 
but given, you know, if you're making like an informed decision and, you know, or a guess to how long and you're looking at the past three years, um, the decline has been pretty steadily the same. And if we follow that pattern, that's where things get pretty like, not predictable, but um, I guess knowing that, okay, if I decreased 10% in my FEV1 last year, and if I decreased 10% this year, that leaves me in the single digits um, of lo like for your lung function, I'm talking about lung function numbers. Sorry, sometimes I use like CF terminology and I'm like, right, not everybody knows that. Um, it's good, every not everybody knows that. But um, for comparison, a normal person is 100% or over 100% for their pulmonary function. And I am right now sitting around 19%. So if we decline that average that we've seen over the past three years to around 10%, I will without a doubt be in the single digits. And I know how exhausted I am now and I can't even, I don't even know what that would be like. I don't know, you know, I can almost um, guarantee I would be at the very least dependent on oxygen. Um, not able, I mean, possibly in a wheelchair if I couldn't walk, be bedridden, who knows? Um, and in, in that condition, I can like, would not be able to receive a transplant. So, yeah, I guess it's the past few days, I've just I've had obviously way too much time to think, which really hasn't been helpful either. Um, in this whole process, but I guess if I have to do it, I have to do it, and um, I just don't know. I don't, you know, I wish, like, I had an answer of, like, well, this is what I want to do, um, but I don't. I've been talking to some doctors about potentially going into palliative care, not necessarily palliative care um, different than hospice. Um, you can go into palliative care without, I think hospice like requires you to have like under six months left of your life. So that's a little different. Um, palliative care you can be in for a longer period of time. And I've actually had several nurses over the past two years refer me to palliative care because of how much mal um, treatment, like malpractice I've experienced here. And just kind of with like the overall lack of empathy and understanding that my pulmonary team has had while I've been in here. A lot of my nurses who've known me a long time or just, you know, are really kind to people are saying, hey, I don't want to scare you by saying this, but palliative care might be an actually great option for you because from what I've heard, um, not just from nurses, but from other people, um, is that it can be a really positive experience in terms of finally being comfortable, getting care. Um, I think there's a better sense of treatment and humanity versus, you know, these doctors who are kind of, you know, just like on their run of like, check, 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 check. And you know, you kind of just turn into this number in their book of like, gotta get to this patient, move on. Um, there's, you know, that lack of humanization there when hospice is, not hospice, um, palliative care allows more room for, I think, a more sympathetic, understanding and gentle experience. Um, so it is something I am thinking about. Um, and whether or not I go into it or not, that does not mean I'm like dying the next day um, or the next year or years. You don't know. Um, again, but 
again, I would rather not run the risk of just being consistently frustrated and stressed out um, and maybe just try something else out that could benefit me mentally, which I think is a big part of what they're missing here is they don't view a person holistically, they view a person for what they are treating them for. So to them, I am just lungs. I am not a like full human being with a mind that functions, um, that has emotions. Um, I am just a broken pair of lungs that they wanna, you know, shoot out of me and throw some new ones in and take their little trophy away. You know, it's like, oh God, the healthcare system. But, because that's what you end up feeling like. You end up feeling like, Okay, I am just my doctor's trophy to say I saved this patient from, you know, their terminal shitty illness by getting them a transplant. And that's just, it's frankly bullshit. Like, I've watched people in the CF community, one after another, just drop like flies after transplants from so many complications, from, you know, people who didn't truly want it and weren't ready for it, or... People who got it and then weren't able to take care of themselves after or can't afford. It's just like there's so many different things planned to it, but they're not going to tell you that. Like, that's the thing the doctors don't, you know, highlight. They don't, they like to talk about, you know, the four or five patients they had who had perfect transplants and went on and lived their life and how beautiful it was. And I'm not discrediting that. However, when it's your life you're dealing with, like, you want the reality. You don't want this, like sugar-coated, rose-colored, like, view of your potential life that could actually be extremely, like, extremely fabricated, you know? Like, it's just not realistic. Um, and so I think right now it's, I think people think I'm being pessimistic at times and it's, or that I'm catastrophizing and it's truly not. It's truly the reality of the situation. And it's, I think I need to talk about it more. I need to talk about the idea of palliative care and myself in the same sentence. Um, if I'm ever going to get to a place of being able to just appreciate each moment and not be constantly stressed, if that makes sense. Um, unfortunately, so many people are uncomfortable with that. And I've seen this because my support system has, my, I, let me rephrase that, my immediate support system. So like my closest circle of people, you know, that has drastically shrunk in the past two years. Um, the sicker I get almost bound somebody else leaves and as a sick person it's just it's heartbreaking because it's like right when you need these people the most it's when they dip and you know I get it to some degree it's like you don't want to be around you know this walking reminder that you're gonna die or this walking reminder that your best friend's gonna die and that you're gonna have to deal with it um but it's also very like selfish um because terminal or not terminal, we're still alive right now, and we're still human right now. So taking away our ability to have that support is just really, really shitty. Like, it's just shitty. Um, I don't know. So I guess I'm going to try to wrap this up, but a lot of people are asking me right now, you know, like, what do you need? Um, in terms of support and I'm talking about outside of financial support although I will say like holy fucking shit this fundraiser you guys are absolutely amazing and every time I check it my mind is just blown away like absolutely blown away um and the messages I've received and I know I haven't been able to answer in length but I do truly, truly appreciate everything from the bottom of my heart. I really can't like even say that more because there's not something 
there's not real words to put um, to the support that ha I've been showered with, um, despite how terrifying this all is. So, yeah, thank you. Um, but back to what I was saying. Um, yeah, a lot of people are asking, you know, what do you want? Like, what do you need? What's the best way to support you? And I've been thinking about that. I think one thing just as a general blanket is I think I need people to listen and to see me for, for me. I need listening that is active listening, you know, like not half-assed, like half on my phone, um, I'm doing this kind of listening to you, kind of not, I forgot what you said, can you re-educate me on this? You know, that type of thing gets really frustrating because it's, we're already tired, we don't want to have to re-educate those, like, on what we're going through over and over and over again, it gets exhausting, and it's also pretty traumatic to have to re, um, like, I've had to do this a lot in the hospital, um, you know, rehash the story of getting your prognosis or the story of your decline or you know whatever you want to phrase that as it's not something you really get used to saying or talking about so I just think listening and being you know an active listener is really important I think allowing space for things that you might be uncomfortable with. If you're, like, if you truly, truly care about a person, you're gonna have to put yourself aside sometimes and say, you know what, like, this isn't an easy conversation for me to have, but I care about this person, so I'm going to allow them to release what they need to release in this moment because I care and I want to be there. Um, and I get it, it's not easy, but I think it's also something we need to work on and he, just as humanity, you know, kind of putting herself aside to try to truly understand someone else's situation. And that goes for literally anything, like not just my situation, like, any oppressed person, any, any of those. Um, it's, yeah, it's kind of like putting, putting your fears on the shelf for a moment to allow in this situation me voice mine, even if they also scare you, you know, like I know personally you know, I have been this person for people. Um, and it's not easy. <laughs> it's not easy when you love and care about somebody and, you know, they're talking about their own death. And obviously, like, you don't want to hear it. They never wanted to hear it. But it is so, so crucial that it is talked about. Because without talking about it, it's, I mean, like, that shit eats you up. You know, like, it's not fair. And I think everyone should be entitled to that listening period, that, that time where you can just say what you're feeling um, completely in a way that is raw and in a way that you're, you don't feel that you have to hide anything, no matter like how morbid or how terrifying it is. I think we need to allow more space for those conversations because they're the important ones. Like they're the ones that help. They're the ones that make a difference. They're the ones that, you know, lift something off my shoulder. It's not the ones that are, you know, hey, how are you doing? Fine today. Okay, um, you know, talk to you tomorrow like that's not or you know sending dumb shit back and forth like it's not that stuff that gets me through it's the 
It's the heavy, potent conversations that neither one of us, frankly, want to be a part of, but we show up for because it's important. Um, I think that's really like, for me, that's all I'm asking for right now. And if I need something else, you know, I will try to voice that. But I think right now the biggest thing I need is people in, you know, a solid support system around me um, that I feel comfortable and that I trust aren't going to leave. Because when you've had people leave time after time after time because they're uncomfortable with you being sick, you get less and less likely to keep talking about it. So I think, you know, I'm trying to push myself to keep talking about it because people who are sick, people who are terminally ill deserve that voice until their last breath. And if people don't want to hear it, then that's their issue. I am tired of apologizing and my closest friends know this I'm a they're like shut up stop apologizing and I'm the absolute worst but like especially now more than ever when everything is like completely fucking unknown and there's this massive chance that I have you know a year or two left the last thing I should be worrying about is fucking apologizing like has taught me anything it's to just literally live as you are and do it in the way that you want to because it's like I said it's like a month ago I wasn't even worried about any of this now here I am you know so yeah I don't know I will leave it at that um I appreciate, again, anyone who listens to these, because I know I just ramble a lot and I'm not really always the most coherent depending on when I've gotten meds in here. But I hope this maybe helps some people understand where like my mind is in terms of, you know, where, how I'm trying to process this idea of transplant dying, coping with both of those, coping with how one leads to the other or how they relate to each other or how they don't relate to each other um, and how either one of them can happen without the other. But regardless, they're both in my head. So yeah, I don't know. Um, I will stop now because if not, I'm just going to keep going. But thank you. Um, and I will see you next time.